Hi, I'm Eric McGill. I'm here with Resident Undead and the Mad Crew, and I'm here with Michelle Bellinger, and we're talking about the Inspiration House. Thank you, Michelle, so much for having us out today. Oh, hey, thanks for coming out. I know some of you traveled a long way, and uh, trying to coordinate this many people for something like this is never a small task. Well, yeah, I know. I only drove an hour, so I yeah, could. Forty minutes for me. <laughs> I was gonna say I'll come over more often. Yeah. Oh no, it's it, it it it's a cool little place. Like even even if you're not doing a ghost hunt, it's fun to just kind of like I I love Oberlin. Like it's a cool town to just step back out of the the, the maddening noise of social media and all the bad news right now. Right. Well, you know, coming into this area is almost like stepping backward in time. You know, yeah. not to sound cliche, but you have a lot going on here that hasn't been touched yet. Yeah. It's yeah. real. It's really a nice area. Yeah, no, I, I really like it. So one of the things, uh, one of the interesting topics that we would like your insight on mm -hmm. is you, you had mentioned uh, keeping these buildings around. Yeah. Well, what happens if, say, for example, we let these buildings get tore down? Where do these spirits go? This is something I've always wanted to ask you. Where do these spirits go? I agree with Lloyd Auerbach um, in the sense that spirits are only stuck in a place for the time that they think that they are. Like, they, they, they can get up and move and, and follow people, be attached to objects, uh, and, and have a lot more recognizance than we tend to assume. Um, your, your classic ghost story is always, and it goes back to like Greek and Roman beliefs about improper burial, is uh, a, a ghost is haunting the place where they died, um, usually for vengeance or because their remains were not properly interred. Uh, and that's that's more folklore than it is practice, at least in my my experience. Uh, you'll end up with a spirit in a location like this, like, like Inspiration House. There's, I, I am convinced that there are at least three intelligent hauntings, and they are people who spent almost their entire lives in the house, so they are very invested in the space. They're not stuck. They're not bound. They could get up and go wandering around wherever they wanted to, but they don't want to because they love the house. It's the place they were the most comfortable, uh, where they, you know, live the best and maybe the worst moments of their lives. Uh, so when you tear something like this down, well, the first thing is, is if there was somebody who was really attached to that place and they really loved that place, they're going to be pissed off. They're likely to, if a new structure goes on that location, start showing their presence as well as their displeasure for something that is no longer the thing that they got used to. Uh, spirits, intelligent ghosts, are creatures of habit, like very much stuck in their ruts. Uh, and so like if you take away the thing that they that they love, the thing that they were invested in, that's one way you get a pretty pissed off haunting. Yeah, you talked about, say, tearing down a, a, yeah. a, a building such as this. And now the spirit is still here. Yeah. We build a new structure, and now we have an angry spirit. Yeah. Is that going to generally be the case? I wouldn't say 100% of the time, but I think that it's a high possibility. And if they don't stay on the exact location, they may end up in homes around it. I know growing up um, in Hinkley, uh, we had this little guy named Mikey, and you know, at the time, I think I was like maybe nine or ten. I, I got into this stuff really young. So, um, and we were doing Ouija board session. We can cover that at any other time. But you're nine or ten again. It was a Milton Bradley game, for goodness sake. <laughs> um, but Mikey had uh, not lived in the house that I lived in because it was built in like the 40s or so. But he had lived around there, and he his house didn't exist anymore. He was pretty clear about that. So our house looked interesting, and that's why he ended up there. So they'll go wandering, and sometimes they don't wander very far. Uh, so, you know, somebody who lives, you know, three doors down and happen to be more interesting than the people one door down might find themselves suddenly with a haunting if something that has a lot of active, intelligent spirits in it gets knocked down. Um, do, do they always get angry? I mean, Mikey was fine. He was just playful. Um, he died young, probably, of tuberculosis. He didn't know the name of the thing. He just talked about coughing a lot. Um, you heard that, right? I did. Anyway, <laughs> moving on. Yeah. Uh, one of the classic things that people experience is when they move into a house and they start doing repairs or renovations, that's when the activity starts up. And tearing it down is sort of an extreme version of that. I mean, the, the spirits that are tied to a location, 
that are used to having it a certain way start to object to the renovations. They've got opinions. Um, some of those opinions do not match the opinions of the new residents. Uh, and again, with, with a larger place, uh, with some place that has fallen to dust or that has to be condemned, they're going to have opinions of, of what happened to it. On the other hand, they're going to have opinions if you're helping to preserve something that they love. So yeah, something as simple as moving a piece of furniture in somebody's home, mm -hmm. and, and we're referring to the spirit or the entity that's present in the yeah. home, this can cause some emotion. Yeah. Does it cause confusion as well? Sometimes confusion. Um, I, I've personally witnessed a haunting where uh, there was an addition, and so like some walls and things had been put in that weren't there before, and the spirit had a, a, a path that he would tend to follow. And he would just, he would go down and then he would turn into the wall. And the, the son who lived in the room where this change had happened, turning into the wall, agitation followed. Like, like cause, cause what he was used to doing was like walking out, walking um, through this thing out onto like a veranda or like a widow's walk or something and like looking out onto the bay. And while he still followed the path, he'd get pretty annoyed that it didn't look the way that it used to. Cause I think he was just standing inside a wall at that point. Um, there was, it was an apartment, actually it was an old house that had been turned into several apartments down in uh, Columbus, Ohio. And that place, first of all, I, I questioned the landlord's choices of exactly how they parceled some of it up because it was like a whole chunk of dead space. Uh, and and th that's one thing that I've definitely noticed in um, renovations is like if you leave spaces that were previously open, you just wall them off. Weird activity results. And I, I got some theories on that, and I think it, it does come down to what's familiar, what's not familiar, and then the fact that if people are no longer moving in and out of that space, it it clogs up, it gets uh, stuff. What, gets clog, clogged. What, what clogs up? Well, so I, I subscribe to the theory that a lot of this comes down to energy, um, and, and emotions are carried on the energy, uh, spirits and people f create paths, pathways of energy. Uh, there, there's an Asian tradition called feng shui, um, which is uh, Chinese geomancy, uh, and part of that comes down to the idea that if you imagine that we're all kind of standing on the bottom of the ocean, we don't realize that we're wet, so we don't realize that we're moving through energy and, and exchanging it constantly. But um, in feng shui, the path a person takes habitually into the house, out of the house, uh, the way you walk through doors and things, creates currents. Um, if you were ever a kid and you had like a, a, one of those round swimming pools and you all got your friends to go around and around in circles and you would create a current, those sort of currents make the energy flow through spaces. And similarly, the places in your house where you don't tend to go, like your attic or your basement, some of the most classically haunted places, don't get that sort of flow going. People don't go there very often. Um, and energy builds up in, in ways where it starts to kind of like get yucky and crusty and attracts negative stuff or uh, emotions and things will build up. So if basically like in, in having stuff move and circulate without stuff getting blocked up or, or lost in basements, attics, shut off little things, closets, uh, there's a natural healthy circulatory flow in, in a home. Um, that you know, both the residents and the space are part of this reciprocal interaction. And the spaces that you don't visit often, that's where things start to get blocked, like, like clogged arteries. Um, and then the negative emotions, or, or just, you know, it doesn't have to be negative, just whatever you've been experiencing, the family that lives there. If they had an argument, like it'll linger a little bit in the room, but it'll just sort of seep into the places that they don't clear out regularly. And then things can be attracted to that. Well, with with regard to the inspiration house yeah. here, we're going to go back to that. Oh yeah, because oh there there's yeah there was... there's there's got to be some emotion trapped in here. Holy moly! Yeah. <laughs> so, this home has been here since 1870. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. It was built in 1869, um, finished in 1870, and then uh, it was livable in, in 1870 um, by Penfield. Um, Isaac Penfield was the father. And I think it was Herbert Penfield. And if I have the right guy tracked down, um, he died within a few years of taking over the house. So still don't know the full story with that. But yeah, so 1870. So, so we have mayors who lived here. Yeah. We have doctors who yeah. have lived here. What kind of stress and emotion 
could be trapped inside of these walls here. So much, but the, the funny thing with this place was the loudest stuff that the people who owned this house right before we did um, had a number of very bad events happen to them in a short period of time. Whether or not those were attached, like like somehow the house was responsible, I, I, I don't know and don't want to conjecture yet, but what I will say that upon taking control of the house, um, there, there were some really bad things that happened to both of the, the married people that were in this house. Um, because they're still around and they're both lawyers, they don't really like want to, but, but they left enough of their personal information where it's, it's clear terrible things happened to them. And it caused their relationship to melt down. And the first thing that we noticed coming into this space was just the tactical nuclear meltdown of their relationship. The so this is residual energy that we're talking about right now. We're not talking about the intelligent haunt. Yeah, it's, it's not an intelligent haunt. This is just residual haunting. Um, it's leftover emotion uh, from the previous two owners. Something that happens really commonly with that is without realizing that they're responding to essentially like a psychic thumbprint, like, like psychic dust, um, the dirt that the people have left behind that most people don't know how to clear out of a house. Um, if if me and my if Elyria and I had just moved in and didn't know that this was a phenomenon, we started finding ourselves experiencing a lot of the same things that the two previous owners had been experiencing. A lot of the feelings of self doubt and worthlessness, um, anger, like and like by the end of the day with uh, working, like we put in really long hours getting this place put together, 15 to 18 hours a day sometimes, no breaks. Like we just worked solid for two months, so understandably we were like okay we might be tired we might be cranky but it had a pattern that and once we realized that we were even like parroting back like almost word for word things that we'd seen in some of their diaries I was like okay <laughs> putting the brakes on like I, I kind of wanted to be sure that this is what's happening but what we're doing is we're, we're reacting to we're resonating with the emotions that are left in the house when someone experiences an emotion you don't have to be psychic to pick up on it and, and I will say this Everybody has experienced this at least once, where two people are arguing in a room, they're not arguing anymore, they're not even in the room anymore, but you walk into that room and you can feel it. Like there is just a tension on the air. Um, and almost everyone can sense this. It's why when you live under the same roof with people who are arguing, you know, it's not just the mental stress, like there's just some oppressive quality to it, and it really makes people miserable over time. Well, that stuff gets left. Um, and I fortunately know how to clear it out. So I, I spent probably two hours cleaning this house from top to bottom once we were like, nope, it's definitely psychic residue and it's psychic residue I don't want. Um, and just because what would happen is if we didn't know how to do that and we didn't know that these were emotions that we were picking up on and they were not ours. I mean, your average person, you experience the emotion, you assume it's yours you don't think of yourself a psychic so clearly you're not you know just picking up on psychic stuff i definitely and, and, and then not psychic and then you just start acting on it because and, and you're like well maybe i'm just kind of bipolar this week maybe i'm just having mood swings i don't know like you just you, you justify it to yourself um and and i see that so commonly with most hauntings so anyway to, to get back to clearing it um simplest way is literally to just clean the house but while you're cleaning it also do it with intention also do energy work almost do reiki on the house to clear out and scrape away um that, that those emotions and go into every corner uh every closet attic basement every place where it might like be building up places where people ordinarily wouldn't go and i in this case i went from top to bottom and then just swept it all right out of the front door um there's uh, a couple of different traditions that have like neat ways to deal with that like um in in american hoodoo uh you have like a a vinegar wash and you like you you just scrub the floors and scrub the bad energy out of the house and it smells god awful when you're done oh my god yeah it's it's <laughs> stifling oh it, yeah. it's it's pretty pretty awful um it, we we've adopted uh the native american idea of smudge sticks where um and, and one of the reasons that smudge sticks were used is the smoke uh, was not only seen as, as cleansing, it was seen as being like the closest thing to energy. Um, it, it's, it's as close to energy as physical stuff is going to get. 
Um, additionally, sage has a lot of the things that were used in saging and different smudging techniques uh, have natural antibacterial properties to them as, as herbs, like there's, there's actual science behind them. Um, so the smoke is used then to fume the stuff out and you, you use it, you're basically washing a space or washing a person with the smoke and what the smoke carries and what the smoke represents. Um, in a European tradition, um, they would fumigate. Uh, and like before fumigation was a thing that you did to get rid of an insect infestation, you did it to get rid of malaria, bad air. Um, most diseases were thought to be carried on bad smells. And so there were incenses and things that you would just smoke a house out with to clear them of the bad things. And as happy circumstance or design has it, many of those things did have sanitizing effects, which, which is one of those things where you can't kind of... Psychic stuff and physical stuff and psychological stuff all tend to be in a big messy lump. Folklore, actual history, just because something wasn't written down mm -hmm. doesn't mean it didn't happen. So yes. how do we separate the folklore from the actual history? I think you need to take all of it into account. I think you need to collect all of it. I, I'm, I'm a big person for archiving as much as possible and understanding that there's often an oral tradition. For me, when I come into a place like this, what I try to do is to not research anything. I just go in cold uh, and I get as much of my impressions I can at first and I write as much down as possible so that I'm not skewing what, what I've experienced. Uh, and then only after I think that I've picked up as much as I'm going to as a psychic do I start the historical research to compare and contrast and like rule out and see what might have been legitimate. Um, but I also like to talk to people, um, hear their stories, and I, I definitely look into the folklore of a location um, because I've often found you will have haunted locations Places where people have definitely experienced stuff tend to also be on physical land where for generations, centuries, things have been associated with it. And whether some one person calls it a ghost or another person has reported it as a UFO phenomenon, there's often crossover in the actual experiences that they're describing. They're just interpreting them differently. Well, thank you so much, Michelle, for meeting with us and letting us know your thoughts on all of this here. Uh, how, how do people book an investigation here oh. at the Inspiration House? Well, right now, Inspiration House, um, the website's Inspiration 36, because the, the address is 36 South Street. If you look for Cowling Funeral Home out here in uh, Oberlin, you, you found the place. It's hard to miss. It's the only brick house on the oh, street. Oh, beautiful. I, I really, really love it. Um, right now, it's up on Airbnb. Uh, we had to put on the warning, like we didn't put it up on Airbnb as like, this is a haunted location. We were just like, you know, lovely little, I think it was cozy artist retreat. But we had enough people who stayed here who were like in the private messages going, hey, there was this, I mean, I really love the house, but there was this thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there was one person who cut her visit short. And I think it might have been because the place kind of freaked her out a little bit. It was not what she was expecting. What if somebody would like for you to be here? We need to book that in advance. Yeah, yeah, you'll you'll want to you want to book that stuff in advance. Uh, I'll I will do like limited stuff where I'm doing classes, but I'll also be leading ghost hunts. Uh, and full disclosure, my ghost hunts are often always a learning experience too. Like I like do you like to educate process. and teach. Yeah. Yeah, I really do. What if somebody would like to learn more about what you do? Can we buy books? Um, probably the Ghost Hunter Survival Guide is the best place for paranormal investigators to start with. I know that a lot of teams use it as uh, required reading. Uh, if you want kind of like a full like overview of all the stuff that I do, because it's a lot from music to teaching to writing to um, fiction writing, uh, michellebelanger.com. So my first and my last name dot com is sort of the clearinghouse of everything. And it's not uh, pronounced like it's spelled. Well, for, well, for no, me, well, I mean, no. if, I would want to say American, it phonetically. Yeah, if, if you're American, it's Belanger or Belanger. Belanger. <laughs> just just Bel-anger. Right, <laughs> if right. If it's French, it means beautiful angel, so.